Good evening, everyone, and welcome. My name is Mary Hoffman, and I'm with the Office of Alumni Relations. Thank you all for coming to the Stony Brook Alumni Association Faculty Lecture. This is our inaugural faculty lecture, and I'm delighted that you're all here. We're also delighted to host Stony Brook's distinguished professor and chair of the Molecular Genetics and, Bio and Microbiology Department and founder of the Center for Infectious Disease, Dr. Orhe Benash. Dr. Benash will present his findings on Lyme disease. Dr. Benash has been on the, on the forefront of research on Lyme disease, and we're very proud to call him one of our own. We recently surveyed our alumni asking how we, how we can contribute to uh, once they leave Stony Brook to their lives. And the response was a resounding, more intellectual programming. So we're here to oblige. As you know, Lyme disease is not contained to Long Island alone. You'll hear from Dr. Benash that it's spreading around the world. In fact, I got an email recently in the last week or so from a gentleman in Australia who asked us to video record this because he now is, is experiencing Lyme disease. The format of the evening is Dr. Benash will present for about an hour, followed by a question and answer period. We're going to ask you to hold your questions till the end, and we will have microphones on both sides for you to, um, to use. And we ask that, in fact, you do use the microphones because we are video recording it. Before we hear from Dr. Benash, I'm delighted to introduce Dr. David Tenassi. Dr. Tenassi works closely with Dr. Benash and is professor and vice chair of the Department of Molecular Genetics and Microbiology and a member of the Center for Infectious Disease. Dr. Tenassi? Well, thank you very much, and it's a real pleasure to welcome you here today and to introduce Dr. Jorge Benach to you and uh, to introduce his, his talk about Lyme disease. So I just wanted to give a little background and history of uh, Dr. Benach's work um, at Stony Brook and, um, and how he came in, into the Lyme disease field. So Dr. Benach got his start at, uh, at uh, uh, Rutgers University, where he got his PhD degree in microbiology. And then he took a fellowship at the uh, National Disease Laboratory, the Rocky Mountain Laboratory in Montana, where he started working on, on tick-transmitted diseases. And he worked on a, a bacterial pathogen called rickettsia that causes a, a disease called Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever. And he did this work uh, with a, a prominent researcher named Dr. Uh, Willie Bergdorfer. And following these studies, he, uh, he became a research scientist back here in New York State with the Department of Health. And in 1976, he took a position here at Stony Brook University. And that position was actually to start looking at an outbreak of Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever, again, a tick-transmitted disease, here on Long Island. And this was just, um, just after the time that Lyme disease was really formally uh, termed or, or coined as, as a, defined as a disease. So this, of course, um, in 1975, um, uh, the disease was defined uh, as the outbreak on, uh, in Lyme, Connecticut. And so Jorge began working here on Long Island on a Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever. And then in the late 70s, he also began working on an outbreak of another tick-transmitted disease on the east end of Long Island called babesiosis. And what Dr. Benach noticed was that there was often symptoms of Lyme in the patients that had babesiosis. And so they began to thinking that maybe there was a co-infection, that maybe the ticks were also harboring this Lyme agent. And so in a really seminal set of papers uh, and studies in the, in the early 1980s, Dr. Benach and his team um, first worked uh, to look at ticks that he isolated out on Shelter Island, actually, and examine the contents of these ticks uh, with his uh, colleague, uh, Dr. Bergdorfer, at the Rocky Mountain Labs and identified a novel, uh, very interesting corkscrew-shaped corkscrew spiral bacterium called, uh, that has been since named Borrelia burgdorferi after Bergdorfer. And he showed that this uh, novel bacterium was present in the ticks. And then in the following year, uh, he, he did, in a study published in the New England Journal of Medicine, he isolated from the blood of patients here in Long Island with Lyme uh, this, uh, this spirochetal bacterial agent. And then the following year after that, he showed that these, the reservoir where this bacteria exists is in the mouse population, and again, work here on Long Island. And so the mice transmit it to the ticks, and then the ticks can transmit it to the people. And so over the years, Jorge has done, again, seminal work to define this disease, 
uh, with now close to 200, or, or, you know, approximately 200 publications on this area. And he has, of course, risen through the ranks here at Stony Brook University. Um, uh, as was mentioned, he is currently the director of the Center for Infectious Diseases here at Stony Brook. He is the chair, chairman of the Department of Molecular Genetics and Microbiology and has received many honors, which I will limit to a few brief highlights, uh, including named Distinguished University Professor here at Stony Brook. Um, he has received a merit award from the National Institutes of Health. He has served on the advisory council for the National Institute of the Allergy and Infectious Diseases, and he has been appointed to really prestigious um, academies of science. So these include the Infectious Disease Society of America, the American Academy of Microbiology, and the American Association for the Advancement of Science. And finally, before uh, bringing to the stage, I just want to say that he's not only really been a, a great scientific uh, presence, but he's really been a, a great presence here at Stony Brook, contributed in many ways to advancing the mission of Stony Brook University. And as I like to say to him often, he really is a true treasure of Stony Brook University. And I hope you'll join me in welcoming him, him to the stage. Thank you, Mary, for the, the first introduction, and, and thank you, David, for the, um, uh, for the second introduction, which was really, truly over the top. But when he calls me a treasure, he's not serious. He's joking. And I, I think that's fine, because um, it, um, it, it's probably accurate that, that he should be joking, and, and, and the treasure thing is um, sort of an inside joke at this stage. So again, thank you all for coming. Uh, I. Um, I was asked to do this lecture, and I am very happy to, to do this, and I understand that one can do this lecture in a number of ways. One can take uh, the direct science route, which I think would be not probably appropriate for, for this venue. So what I tried to do was just, in, in, this, in, in this hour that I have, is to try to get you to understand what are all the parts of this disease. And <clears throat> This is the, uh, the title of the talk, is Lyme disease is on the rise, and the question is, are you prepared? Hopefully, by the end of the talk, you might be prepared. At the very least, you'll be prepared to recognize what it is that we're dealing with and understand it, and maybe even like it from a perspective that this is a very, very well choreographed ballet between tick, pathogen, and patient. And you will see how this actually happens as we go along. So what I want to do is I, I want to be able to tell you how to get to know the tick vector and how to get to know the Borrelia and how to get to know the disease, and in that order. So some tick talk. Uh, and uh, I should tell you there's about 30 species of ticks that are found in New York State. And there are many animals that have their own species of ticks. Sometimes they're very specifically associated, one tick per species. Of these 10 commonly by humans, and of these 10, four species can potentially transmit diseases to man in New York. Luckily or unluckily, all these four oops, occur in Long Island. And let me, let me start out by the deer tick, which is Ixodes scapularis. Uh, can you see the pointer? It's, okay, so this is, this is a so-called deer tick, and this is the tick that transmits the Borrelia and gives you the Lyme disease, but this is also the same tick that transmits the Babesia microti organism. This is, as David alluded to, uh, a protozoan disease, a hemoprotozoan disease that looks very much like malaria, and instead of being transmitted by a mosquito, it is transmitted by this tick. And then there's another one yet, another organism, <coughs> which is called Anaplasma phagocytophilum, a very, very recent identification. It was identified in the last decade, and this is an organism that actually does a very, very, very unique uh, trick. It inhabits neutrophils. And neutrophils are the one cell in the body that we count on to fight an, uh, to fight an infection. So these three organisms, uh, the Borrelia, the Anaplasma, and the Babesia, can all be transmitted by this tick, sometimes singly, most often singly, I, I should say, sometimes in pairs, and in, in some instances that have been known in the literature, in triples. So this tick is a potential time bomb. The other tick that I want to talk about is the American dog tick, much larger than the deer tick. 
Uh, most of you probably recognize this stick. This is brown, and this one, this one is a red brick collar. This one has long mouth parts, this one has short mouth parts. And this is the tick that has been in Long Island since time immemorial. This is the tick that transmits the rickettsia. There are some historical uh, accounts of outbreaks of Rocky Mountain spotted fever uh, associated with this tick way out in, in, in Montauk in, in, uh, in an area where the Rough Riders of Teddy Roosevelt came back uh, from, from the tropics to uh, take a rest in, in, in this area. And this is how much long ago we, we knew about, uh, about this tick and, and the rickettsia. The Lone Star tick is also of great, great actual interest. The Lone Star name comes from the fact that there is a uh, what appears to be a Lone Star on the dorsum of the, of the tick. But it also takes the name from Lone Star because this tick actually came from Texas. And for whatever reason or reasons, this tick has invaded the Northeast, particularly New York, and gone all the way to Maine. Uh, some say global warming, some say genetic changes in the tick, but a very point that needs to be made here is that in, when I first came here in 1976, this tick was non-existent in Long Island. Today, it is the most common tick that we can find in New York State. And it may be that this tick, at least, at least from some ecological point of view, may be displacing the other two. Because we have actually noted, again, maybe perhaps anecdotally, that these two ticks are not as plentiful as they once were. So this invasion of this tick is, is a very intriguing uh, situation, and one that we could probably spend another hour talking about. This one here is uh, with well-known well -known ticks, certainly known to the, uh, to the entomologists and to the microbiologists. It's a disease that actually transmits certain viruses. One of them, it may be in the, uh, in the, in the lay press in the last year or so, which is called Powassan virus. And it's, um, depending on who gets it, it can be a pretty deadly virus. But for the purposes of the talk today, I'm, I think I'm going to focus on this one, simply because it is the Lyme disease tick. But what I say about their life cycles, et cetera, could probably be uh, uh, linked or associated to all of them. So how do we, how do we come in contact with a tick? And this is, a, this is an old, old experiment that we did. I believe it was in the 70s or in the 80s. We, we flagged and collected a number of ticks. We brought them into the lab. We dusted them with a yellow fluorescent dye and we released them back to where we got them. And this is what we found, that they are on the grass, and you can see all the yellow ticks hanging in the grass. This is what these ticks do. They hang out in the grass, they wait for someone, that could be a deer, a mouse, a horse, a person, a dog, and as they move through a tick-infested area, the ticks latch onto them. And then they move up into the body, and very often, this is why this would explain why we would see ticks that are in the ears of dogs, in the ears, for example, in, in, in horses, and usually in people around the head area. But um, this, is, this is the behavior of the tick, and it's very, very unique behavior. But it's not an active behavior. Ticks don't chase after you. They wait, and wait, and wait until patiently, Somebody comes along that they can actually latch on to and do what they need to do. And this is not easy. I would say probably 95% of all the ticks never go anywhere waiting for somebody. So we keep reducing the population of ticks that are actually actively uh, transmitting organisms and maybe making them better and better at it because we're actually reducing the number of encounters between patients and ticks. And this is, again, a close-up of the way they look. This is, this is the exodes in vegetation. Again, they wait. And they're, um, they don't move around very much. They, they come out when it's sunny. It's easier to get a tick when it's sunny out than when it's raining or when it's cloudy. Uh, and I think that has to do with just general relative humidity. The ticks actually like humidity. And here's a tick. And this is what's called a questing behavior. This is not on a grass, this is on, a, on, a, on another type of vegetation. It finds a host and it attaches to it. They do not fly 
or they do not drop out of trees. And this is how we encounter them. And now this is a scanning electron micrograph of the exotic stick. And I'd like to point out that tick is not an insect. Tick is an arachnid. And the closest relatives to a tick are spiders. And you know they're an arachnid because they, have, they don't have a head. They have a cephalothorax, the mouth parts, and the cephalothorax, and they have the abdomen. And I like to contrast that with an insect, a true insect. For example, take the mosquito, another blood-sucking arthropod that has the antenna, the head, the thorax, and the abdomen, and of course the wings. But not all insects have wings, so the wing in itself is not a characteristic of, of separating the, the two. But one is an arachnid, the other one is a uh, is an insect. And they're both hematophagous. This one, as we all know, is the, uh, usually uh, associated with malaria, transmission of such things as West Nile fever, the fever, dengue virus, and others. And now this is the family of ticks. And what we see here in this photograph is a sesame seed, a poppy seed, the head of a pin. This is a millimeter ruler uh, up here. Uh, I could try this. And then now we look at the family, per se. We start out with the female. Most stick species, the female is usually larger, sometimes twice as large as the male. The female feeds, the male does not. The sole purpose of the male is to mate with the female so that the female can lay a batch of eggs. When the female uh, feeds on a host, and usually the female will feed on hosts that are larger, uh, such as, for example, deer, dogs, people. Uh, and when the female feeds, it lays a clutch of eggs, approximately about 4,000 eggs. And they hatch in about a month. And out of the eggs comes out the first stage of the tick, which is called the larva. The larva will look for another host, usually a much smaller animal, like a mouse or a vole or squirrel, feed, molt, and become the intermediate stage, which is called the nymph. The nymph and the larva, even though they are either sex, uh, they, 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 they are either sex, they are either male or female, are called the subadults. We cannot tell whether they are sex, uh, male or, or, or female. So when this one molts, it will molt into a male or a female, and the cycle will start all over again. So what is the take-home message here? Is that ticks feed three times in their life. Once as a larva, once as a nymph, and once as a female. So imagine, this is, this is a difficult, difficult life. And this is, and if they weren't so dangerous, and if they weren't so, I mean, some people might find them not attractive. Uh, I would say you have to take your hat off to this, to this animal because they are, they are quite good at what they do. But at any rate, let me just continue on this. But the, the, the one take home message is just please remember, feeding three times. Again, here's another family of ticks. Uh, this is the female, about twice as large as the male, the larva and the nymph. This doesn't change, this is another species. And this is the dog tick, this is the female, this is the largest tick of them all that we have around here. This is the female, and this is the larva, the, um, the, um, the nymph, and here is the very tiny male. Now for the mouth parts, what you see here is a structure called the hypostome. And this hypostome, I don't know how, how well or how clearly you can see, but it has barbs. So when the tick drives these mouth parts into the skin, it goes all the way to the deep dermis. And the tick can actually retract the barbs. So when the tick is ready to stop feeding, it can retract the barbs. But if you want the tick to retract the barbs before the tick is ready, you will get a chunk of skin because that's associated with all the, um, uh, with all the, how many of you here have actually seen and taken a tick off your skin? So fundamentally everybody in this room. So you know what I'm talking about. You get the chunk of skin or 
worse, sometimes you can leave the entire cephalothorax in the skin. And you know, some, uh, you, know you have to wait until, until it's actually repelled. But this is, this is what happens. This is the, uh, the, the, the mouth part, so the ticks. And it is the anchoring, um, the anchoring uh, structure, but it is also a straw. Through this canal, the tick can actually spit into the wound and suck the blood. So by definition, a tick sucks the blood and it spits into the wound. They need to be done almost simultaneously because otherwise the tick will not be able to feed. But more on that. Here's what happens. This is a dime. This is what we call the flat tick. This is the flat female Ixodes, the deer tick. This is a female Ixodes tick that has fed on a host for approximately four days. Now, we go back to the picture of the mosquito. Mosquito takes, what, about a minute to feed? From the moment that it lands to the moment that it flies away, it takes approximately a minute. So it's very quick and very efficient. This is not that efficient. It takes, it takes a few days for a tick to get this size. Curiously, even carrying this enormous amount of weight, this tick is actually nimble. And it can actually drop off the host and find itself a place in the litter, leaf litter, in which to, can, in which to lay the eggs. But what happens here? The fact that it's such a long protracted association between tick and host, there's great opportunity for transmission. So at the end of the four days, the number of organisms that get passed from a tick to the patient is usually larger than what you would expect from a very quick mosquito bite. So this is what, what makes ticks so, so very dangerous. The amount of time that they spend uh, on the host. Now, being very candid here, this we see mostly in animals. I mean, how many of us would actually have this thing on and not know it? Uh, but then we have to deal with children that can actually see a tick feed to completion, and as well as, well as animals. So, but it, you don't need to get to be this stage to transmit organisms, and we'll, we'll deal with, with that in, in, in greater detail. Here's another photograph, uh, the same, the, 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 the engorged tick and the flat tick. And now I want to take a, a very brief excursion in, in the, the inside of a tick. And um, what we did here is we made, we made a histological section, a transversal histological section of the tick. This, this is where you'll find to be the mouth parts. And then what I want to point to your attention is are these darker, stru darker structures. These are the salivary glands of the tick. And in this one, you can even see the more salivary glands. This is down from the first one. So this is the slide that we just saw would be up here. And here is the gut of the tick, what's called the mid-gut of the tick. This is a pharynx pump. It's a very strong muscle that the tick uses to suck the blood. The blood comes into the, uh, into the, into the mid-gut, which have diverticula, and eventually swell up to the size of the tick that you saw before. But here again are the salivary glands. And the salivary glands occupy a huge amount of real estate in the tick body compared to our salivary glands in our own bodies. And this is why salivary glands are absolutely essential for the tick. They do two things. One is <clears throat> they, uh, they inject an analgesic so that we don't know or feel that the tick uh, is, is attached. Uh, we don't feel itch, we don't feel pain. And the other one is an anticoagulant. For the tick to feed for days, the tick has to keep the blood flowing. So whenever a tick bites you, don't forget that the tick is injecting stuff on you. And there's quite a bit of that, and I can show you that. And it's very, very important for the pathogenesis of, of tick-borne diseases. This is a salivary gland of a tick. And those of you that know or remember your biology, this is a classical uh, uh, morphology of, uh, 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 of a gland. Uh, 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 of a gland. And here are 
the, the salivary at Sinai, and here's the main canal. And these are, each one of these dots represents a chock full of these proteins that are either the analgesics or the anticoagulants, plus a number of other things that, are, that, that, that have yet even to be identified. So this is when the tick begins to feed, this is what the salivary gland looks like. When the tick is finished and has taken all the blood, this is what it looks like. Uh, all the granules that were in the, in the salivary gland have been, have been essentially transmitted to the host. So the tick empties its salivary glands into the host. And this is part of how the tick actually transmits pathogens to, uh, to people. So what's the life cycle of the deer tick? And certainly I have to stress that this is at this latitude, and this is what you would expect here in, 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 in Long Island or in southern New York State. It's a two-year cycle, and we can go through it. Uh, we can actually, because it is a cycle, we can start actually anywhere. But why don't we just start with a larva? Because these are the, well, let's start with the eggs. The eggs are laid in the spring, anytime between now and probably June. And they hatch. The larva will locate uh, birds that are ground, ground birds, like for example, the, the cat birds that are ground birds, the robins, not all birds get ticks. In order to get a tick, a bird has to be a, 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 a ground bird. It has to be a bird that, that inhabits the, 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 the soil and the ground for, for, for a long time. And of course the mice, voles, chipmunks, small, small rodents. The summer goes through and they molt into the nymph. In the fall, the nymph becomes dormant, and it's dormant for the entire winter. And at the beginning of the spring, the nymph begins to get active, comes out, and now it can feed on a variety of hosts. It can feed on the dog, on people, uh, on, and, and other mice as well. Here's the thing. If this larva fed on this mouse, and this mouse is infected, this nymph is now going to be infected. Which means that this nymph, when it bites any one of this group of people and animals, is going to transmit the infection. So then again, the, the, the nymph feeds, molts, becomes male or female. Female feeds on, uh, on this uh, group of, of, of potential hosts. And it starts all over again. So two year life cycle. And again, when you think about the odds, of one tick surviving this entire odyssey, you have to wonder how good are they at what they do. And if you've worked with these things as long as I have, you, you don't necessarily like them any better, but you do have a certain awe and respect for them because they are um, they're very successful at what they do. Now we talk about the concept of the reservoir, the Borrelia, is an organism that is found in the field mouse. I think we're, we're all acquainted with this little animal. Sometimes they invade our homes. Uh, they, um, they are usually pretty cute. Uh, and this is the main reservoir. So when a larva feeds on this fellow, and this fellow is infected, then the larva will be infected. When the larva becomes a nymph, the nymph will be infected, and then the nymph will transmit. So the bulk of Lyme disease cases occur in the summer, transmitted by nymphs, which is the intermediate stage. And just to, again, remind you, the most common for the larvae and the nymphs are the, uh, field, the field mice, the rodents. And the adult ticks, uh, the female usually will, will seek a deer. Caveat here, even though we call it a deer tick, the deer is not responsible for the Borrelia. Deer don't get Lyme disease. They might get, they might get exposed to the Borrelia, but they don't get it. So deer are important for the life cycle of the tick. This guy is important not only for the life cycle of the tick, but for the life cycle of Borrelia. So 
even though we talk about the deer tick and everybody says, oh my God, we got so many deer. Well, yes, of course, deer are responsible for the ticks. And it goes without saying that if there's deer, you're probably going to have ticks. But just, just before you ascribe any blame, remember that these guys are only responsible for the ticks, not for the Borrelia. And now here's what happens. If a tick is on for at least 36 hours, and the tick is infected, and these wiggles here uh, are to show the Borrelia inside the gut of the tick. And here's the, what we talked about, the hypostome, the barbs, and this is the skin. So in approximately 36 hours, the Borrelia will move from the mid-gut to the salivary glands into the body. So the Borrelia need to go on a trip through the tick into the skin. Uh, for those of you that are very, very interested in molecular microbiology, this organism has a genetic makeup and what is expressed on its surface that is vastly different than the organisms that go into the vertebrate host. Uh, and this is one area of a great deal of, of research interest today. But before I now go into the, uh, into, the, um, in, in, into the actual organism itself, next time that you pick out a tick, just, just take a look at it and, and, and look what, a, what, what a, uh, uh, an animal that doesn't even have a head. And just at least acknowledge the fact that by the time that you have it in your hand, this tick has had a really, truly hard life. And you need to consider this when you think in terms of the whole Lyme disease issue. How difficult it is and how often it happens. So, now we switch gears completely. Now I want to talk about pathogenic spirochetes. There's three groups of pathogenic spirochetes. Uh, one is the Leptospira, uh, and this group causes a rather nasty disease which is veterinary uh, and also humans. In humans, it's usually an occupational infection because you see it in, in people that usually handle animals. But a lot of you that have dogs know that you've, you've inoculated, you've vaccinated your dogs against leptospirosis. You're, you're aware of that, right? You, you've seen in the vaccines, certainly you've gotten in the bill from your bed that you have, that you have vaccinated your, your dogs against, against leptospirosis. Mercifully, it's not very common. And certainly in this part of the world. The second group is the Borrelia, and it includes the relapsing fevers and Lyme disease. These two are very, very similar organisms. <coughs> relapsing fevers occupy the tropical niche of the Borrelia. The Lyme disease occupies the northern hemisphere temperate niche of the Borrelia. Uh, there, are, there are many, many uh, characteristics in common. And then the third group is Treponema. The best known of the Treponema species is Treponema pallidum, which is the agent of syphilis. If you're medically inclined and you look at Lyme disease, and then you look at the, 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 the history or, or, or the clinical history of syphilis, you would note huge parallels. They're very different diseases. Obviously, one is transmitted by a tick, and this is sexually transmitted. But if you put them side by side, they both have a cutaneous stage, they all have a disseminated stage, and they all last for a long time. So these are the, 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 the one thing that you, can, that, that you can do one day and see how, how actually parallel these two diseases are, Lyme and syphilis. Spirochetes have uh, prominent features. They are long compared to other bacteria, and I'm going to show you pictures to, 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 to convince you that they're very long. They have coiled spiral of flat wave morphology have endoflagella, and I'm going to explain what that is. They're highly motile, and they have very small genomes. When you talk about small genome, the first thing that you want to say is, well, they're very primitive. And maybe that's true, uh, but we also can look at the other side of the coin and say, well, they do a lot with what they have. So primitive, perhaps, well adapted, definitely. And I think we need to consider that again now when we talk about Borrelia. In fact, the smallest 
uh, genome in, in the bacteria is uh, that of mycoplasma, followed by the Borrelia. Very small genomes, second smallest in, in the whole of the bacteria. And these are the Borrelia. This is a dark field microscope photograph. And the reason that I mentioned dark field microscope is because the Borrelia are very thin. So they're about 0.2 microns in diameter. So they're very, very difficult to see uh, on the ordinary light microscope, uh, on microscopy. So you need to see them with illumination coming from below. So in a sense of what, what you're actually looking at here is a shadow of the organism. Uh, but we do know that they look like that because we have other means of looking at them, and I will show you what they are. Uh, this, is, this is a scanning electron micrograph of Borrelia burgdorferi sitting on top of a cell. Uh, they like to adhere to surfaces, and they like to adhere to each other. So this is a whole bunch of Borrelia coiled around each other, and you can see them as well here. Uh, and this, this feature of attachment of Borrelia is probably very important because Borrelia can invade a whole different set of, of, um, of tissues in the body, as well as obviously invade the tick. So they're not too choosy as to what, where they, what they adapt or what they adhere to. And here's the telephone, um, I mean, here's a picture of my telephone cord, uh, which is not. This is a scanning electron micrograph of a Borrelia burgdorferi. Uh, here you can clearly see the, uh, the spiral or coiled nature of, of the organism. Uh, the distance between these peaks is of taxonomic importance. And what makes a Borrelia, a Borrelia in this particular con context is that this distance is the largest among the pathogenic uh, spirochetes. The Leptospira, for example, look like uh, pearl necklaces. They're that coiled. And the, and the troponemas are sort of halfway between a Borrelia and a, a Leptospira. And here is a cross-section of the Borrelia. This is magnified approximately a quarter of a million times. And I stress the fact that from here to here, the diameter is, is, is very small. This is what's called the outer membrane of the organism. This is the cell of the organism. This is the, uh, this is the a thin cell wall. And this is what's called a protoplasmic cylinder or part of the cell. Much of what you have in here is uh, the, 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 the DNA, the nucleic acid of the organism. And unique to the spirochetes are these structures, which you can see in cross-section. These are the flagella. Uh, and they're called endoplasmic flagella. And they are inside the organism. So when you see an organism that's moving, they move like a corkscrew. They don't seem to be going anywhere, but they're very, very motile. And I think one of the great, great, um, uh, I, I, I guess, experiences in microbiology is to see these organisms moving in, in, a, in a preparation of blood, because they're very fast and they, they move in, in, in a manner that you say, well, my God, where are they going? They don't seem to be going anywhere, so why are they moving so much? Uh, seems almost a waste of energy, but it's what they do, and it's unique to spirochetes. I should point out, not to, to trouble you with, with chemical formulas, that in the outer membrane of the organism, just as I showed you before, there are some molecules, which are lipoproteins, which account for a lot of the toxicity and the antigenicity of the Borrelia. Very often we call them outer surface proteins. One of these, some of you that are familiar with Lyme disease might know that OSPE, outer surface protein A, was the actual molecule that was used for a vaccine that's no longer in the market. These lipoproteins, pretty much account at the molecular level for how bad these organisms can inflict damage. And how we recognize these lipoproteins is part of what Lyme disease is, is all about. And this is not a Borrelia burgdorferi. This is a relapsing fever Borrelia. And the reason that I put this slide in here is just to show you a comparative uh, size issue here. 
Uh, these are the Borrelia, and these are, this is in the bloodstream. One of the differences between Lyme disease and relapsing fever is that relapsing fever is an infection of the blood. Lyme disease almost never is. So if you look at these cells, these cells are red blood cells. These cells are seven microns in diameter. And the spirochetes are 0.2 microns in diameter. So you see how actually thin they are and how very, very hard they are to actually visualize. So they're very small. And most importantly, they're extremely, what we call in microbiology, they're extremely fastidious. They don't grow well. For example, if <coughs> I come down with a sore throat and I go to the doctor and the doctor takes a swab on my throat, makes a, um, uh, uh, makes a, a culture of, 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 the, of the swab, and in approximately 24 hours, he's got a beautiful culture of strep. And then he can say, ah, well, you've got strep throat. If we were to do the same thing with, or with, with Borrelia, we would have to wait 30 days. In fact, Borrelia divides once, even in the, in the strains that we have had in the laboratory for, 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 for years, Borrelia divides once every 12 hours or so. Compare that to E. coli that divides once every maybe three or four minutes. So working with Borrelia takes a certain level of patience, and it does one nasty thing to patients with Lyme disease. We cannot use culture as the gold standard for diagnosing Lyme disease. Because we have to wait at least 30 days, in fact, for a positive culture of the Borrelia to grow. <coughs> so there are other ways that we can go around this, but the, the bottom line is, they're fastidious, they do not grow well in culture. In fact, if you look at the spirochetes as a whole, Treponema pallidum, the agent of syphilis, has never, ever been cultured in the Labrador. So this is a, 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 a feature of the, of the spirochetes that, that is also very important to keep in mind. OK, and again, before I, uh, I had a, um, a video that I took in the lab of spirochetes moving, but for some reason I couldn't show it here. But um, I, I want to see if there's any way that it can be posted, and I'll talk to Mary about this, and, and when we can fix it, you can, you can take a look at it.